Hello, everyone. Yet once again, it's another day of fresh grace and mercy. This is the Guilt, Grace, Gratitude podcast, where we bridge the gap to Reformed Christian theology for your listening pleasure. Today's book club episode is brought to us by B&H Academic Publishers. We're going to be talking to a repeat guest today, Stephen Wellham. He is the author of a two-volume set uh, on systematic theology from canon to concept. Um, And we're going to be talking about that this book and uh, these two volumes with him here in a moment. So if you go to our uh, show notes, there's a link to B and H academic. It'll take you to this volume. And then also if you guys uh, check out uh, our show notes, you'll also see other resource and information about how to connect with us on uh, you can see this on these conversations on YouTube. You can communicate with us on uh, social media and uh, email and that fun stuff. You can also, if you're not going to a church right now and you're church shopping and trying to find a church to call home, we have a local church finder. It, they are Napark denominations, so the Reform and Presbyterian denominations. Um, so you can find an OPC, PCA, URC, and others. Uh, but we just hope that you are uh, <clears throat> finding a confessionally reformed church or already at one. Um, so hopefully this show drives you to that. But we're also driving you to, uh, you know, good works like systematic theology that Dr. Wellam is going to talk to us about. Um, and so we will get into this conversation and uh, I'm going to read an endorsement we've had uh, from a guest we've had on our show before. But uh, honorable mention, we've had uh, some of the other endorsements we've had on our or people that we've had on our show before. Jonathan Lehman. Uh, we've also had Tom Schreiner. And then, but I'm going to read Michael Horton's um, endorsement of Stephen Wellham's book here. Uh, Stephen Wellham has given us the best systematic theology from the perspective of progressive covenantalism, an alternative to both classic reformed covenant theology and dispensationalism. Wellham casts a wide vision for this third way of interpreting scripture. Although I remain persuaded of the former perspective, I found Wellam's arguments edifying, challenging, and at many points an advance in serious evangelical engagement with Scripture's own theological framework. Plus, he writes for the church that I am that I aim that aim is evident throughout all of the topics. Okay, so I'll let uh, Peter further introduce our guest today. Yeah, it's our. Repeat guest, Dr. Stephen Wellam. He was actually one of the first guests we had on for a book club, his short series in systematic theology, The Person of Christ. And we've had almost all of that series on the show. So it's mm-hmm. fun to have him back on like two and a half years or two and three quarters years yeah. after the last time we had him on. But he's the professor of Christian theology at Southern Baptist <laughs> Theological Seminary, as well as the editor of the Southern Baptist Journal of Theology. It's a pleasure having you back on the show after such a long hiatus, Dr. Wellam. <laughs> well, time goes by very, very fast, but Peter and Nick, great to be back with you again and, and talking about theology. There you go. So this, it is true, Dr. Wellam, Baptists and Presbyterians can get together on a single show and have fun and not argue about baptism. It's It, it can be done. That is right, because we have so much in common. It's not that particular issue, but uh, on 99% of the other doctrinal areas we have in common. So that's what we need to agree on. And there's a larger cause that we're, we're caring about in terms of gospel ministry. There you go. Yeah. So tell the listeners a little bit about Stephen Wellam beyond your academic and church bio. So they may know that you're a professor, you're an author, but let them get to peer back on Stephen Wellam a little bit more. Well, you know, where, where do you start? So uh, I'll start with what my students like to think fascinating. I, I actually come from Canada. Okay. So uh, I have dual citizenship. I've been in the United States since uh, after high school where I came down to college here. But uh, I was raised in the Toronto area. It's probably yep. the easiest place to locate uh, in Canada. And, you know, from a Christian home, very privileged uh to have Christian parents and uh, at a very faithful church, right? And it was a Reformed Baptist church uh, that held to the great doctrines of grace. And my my pastor, Bill Payne, who was from Liverpool, England, and he came over to Canada, was a great John Owen fan. Wow. And uh, <laughs> that's my father bought all of the, from the Banner of Truth versions of John Owen. I know Crossway is 
is redoing those. But uh, I had the John Owen, and then my dad gave me all those volumes, and so I was, uh, you know, taught Calvin Owen and the entire uh, Reformed tradition just as a child, uh, and then was converted, you know, at sixteen, and and then went to um, uh, college in the United States. Uh, did uh, a science degree as an undergrad because I, I thought my, it was actually my mother who recommended that if you're going to go to seminary, uh, sort of broaden your a academic horizon. Yep. And I thought yep. I would do science and then went to Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, did a master's doctorate there. As I finished up my my doctorate in the mid 90s, pastored hmm. uh, in South Dakota. That was uh, ah. way in rural South Dakota it was one of the best experiences of my life and training me to be a, a, a seminary professor. I don't know. I mean, sometimes you have seminary professors that don't have uh, exact pastoral experience, sure. but uh, it's hard to really train seminary students without that. So that was four years there. And then uh, three years on the West coast of Canada, teaching at Trinity Western university, part of the evangelical free church. There was a whole association of seminaries there and I was hired uh, by the the Fellowship Baptists of Canada, hmm. and then uh, came to Southern in in 1999. Uh, been married to my wife Karen. Uh, once I graduated from college, 1985, uh, we got married and we have five children. They're all grown and uh, uh, five grandchildren. And and uh, in my spare time, I like to you know run, uh, do biking, cycling, and. Mm -hmm and read and all those kind of things. So that's a little bit about me. And I don't know if you want anything more, but that gives a, a bit more, a bit sort of the history and but background. I, I do have a nerdy question. And since you have the, I'm assuming it's a 16 volume, John, o have you read the entire set of John Owen from? No, Publishing? no, 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 as I've a, probably read half about half, about half of them, you know, cause I read Christology and pneumatology sure. and it's communion with God yeah. and mortification of sin and, and all of those. But mm -hmm. Uh, you know, I have them there. Obviously, you use books often as resources, but sure. getting, I remember uh, reading this. This will be an interesting story for you. As I was doing my doctorate, just finishing up, we had our first child uh -huh. and we lived in a, a funeral home in, huh. uh, in the Chicago area. Huh. And uh, our son, Joel, he was sort of colicky. He had his sort of days and nights oh. mixed up. So yeah. I was trying to do a paper on John Owen's view of scripture. Uh -huh. And so I was, had him in a snuggly trying to calm him down in the early morning and reading John Owen, <laughs> trying to get prepared for my paper. I like there it. Go. There you go. Yeah. That's what you got to do as a parent sometimes. Yep. Baby one hand, book in the other. Mm -hmm. um, That's exactly right. Cool. So on to the systematic theology. So two part question. So what is, what is unique about the systematic theology? Um, and basically in other words, there are so many systematic theologies in print um, so many people have written this or taken the time to write it, Baptist, Presbyterian, Methodist, whatever it may be. But what maybe what what does this bring to the table that that might be a unique contribution to the field, maybe in general? Yeah, I mean, good question. I mean, you have to ask that question when you go to put out a systematic theology. Why am I doing this, right? Uh, if somebody else has already written on it, then what what is this going to contribute? Is this just simply you know, uh, hey, the same thing filling, over again. Yeah. Do the same thing over filling time and so on. And, and obviously, um, you know, there's nothing new under the sun, right? It, yeah. It's not giving new doctrine, right? It's rooted in uh, historic orthodoxy and the faith once delivered to the saints. Yet there are some uh, unique features of this that I don't think are anywhere else. And, and, and so, so what, what would be unique to it would be, I mean, it, this isn't unique, but it's it's thoroughly, uh, you know, classical in its presentation in terms of doctrine of God, Trinity, Christology. So, in evangelical circles, we, we, there's still debates. Uh, those are becoming less, but we still have debates on the Trinity and classical theism oh, and yeah, so on. Yep, so it's yep. so it's working uh, within that frame, and that, of course, that's not new. I mean, there's many that mm -hmm. will do that, uh, but it's also um, uh, covenantal, right? So for Baptist circles, I mean, obviously Baptists hold a covenants and, and so on, but sure. you know, a lot of Baptist circles are quite diverse. So we have a lot of dispensationalism in our circles. We have 1689 federalism, you know, a whole variety, but it's, it's thoroughly covenantal. Yeah. So it's working with the structures of the Bible. Uh, it is then Baptist, which so it's covenantal, but it's not exactly what we would have, say, in typical Reformed or Covenant theology, Presbyterian yep. thought, and, and and so on. So it's unique in that way. And uh, it also tries to combine 
I mean, we see a little bit of this, I think, in Michael Horton's works and mm -hmm. and in others, but it tries to move uh, from biblical theology to systematic theology so that the whole canon, so that's why the subtitle of of the volume from canon to concept, a, mm -hmm. a phrase that I, I took from Kevin Van Hooser, mm -hmm. who was one of my uh, professors at, at, at Trinity. I thought that was a great way of, of characterizing. We move from whole Bible canon to then theological formulation. Now, obviously, we're doing so, you know, in terms of a hermeneutical spiral. We we don't do that without history. We don't do that with already preconceptions and pre-understandings. Yet you are, I mean, this this is trying to say the whole of Scripture, the storyline of Scripture, the framework of Scripture, the categories of Scripture become foundational to then our theological formulation. So that's a little different. So it's not just merely some systematics go back in a lot of historical treatment. It does cover history, but it's more of, okay, here's all these theologians have said this, or here, maybe you're working from, here's the confession and we'll just simply unpack the confession, which I, you, I use the 1689 uh, second London confession as sort of the, as the, sort of the template largely okay. that, that's governing it uh, type of thing, but it's, you know, it's moving from biblical to systematic and, I guess one last feature of it is there's uh, an apologetic thrust to it as well. So it's not an apologetics book, but I'm trying to, and this is just the way my mind thinks, and it's probably due to the influence of people like Francis Schaeffer and so on on my my thinking, is that theology must uh, help the church. It must be applied to the church, and it must also address the the issues of the day, and it must defend the faith. It must not only expound the faith— but also provide a reason for the hope that is in us. So there's a there's there's an element of that as even as I talk about the storyline of the Bible to try to set it in terms of here's a Christian worldview. Uh, this is how we look at the world over against other views. What's the the foundation for knowledge uh, given our context that we live in a kind of postmodern secular pluralistic culture that really has no grounding for truth, right? So these aren't new ideas. Obviously, you go back to Patristic era, medieval era, especially the the post reformers, where they lay out the Principia, the two foundations mm -hmm. for theology, God and His self revelation. Mm -hmm. But I'm trying to take those concepts and speak them into today's world. So all of those it creates mm -hmm. a bit. I don't think there's any like in the Baptist world. There's nothing sort of like this, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, even within the larger world, I mean, it has a very specific biblical to systematic to apologetic kind of thrust to it. Sure. This is this is both a question for me, and I'm going to ask this question on behalf of a lot of our Baptist brothers and sisters who listen to us. Um, how might this differ from like Wayne Grudem systematic theology back in the day, 20 or so years ago? Because he's less amenable to classical theism. So yeah. maybe how would it maybe how would it differ from his? Because that's that's my guess. When people are looking at this work, they're probably like, okay, how's this different from? The last one that we've seen from Wayne Grudem, which was tremendously popular. So maybe if you can describe some differences from from his work to yours. Yeah, I mean, a great question. And and you know, Wayne Grudem's volume has, for all the criticism that has been leveled, particularly in recent years on on the doctrine of God. I mean, it's sold. I mean, probably it's up to almost Hundreds a million copies. Yeah, yeah. Well, it was seven hundred and fifty last time I, yeah. I saw. So I think it's. Probably, you know, so, so it's, it's affected uh, the churches. Many people read it. Yeah. I it's think I would characterize. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And, and I, I would characterize uh, Wayne Grudem's and he was one of my professors at Trinity yeah. as well. And I greatly uh, respect him is that uh, it, 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 the subtitle, I think speaks to that. It's an introduction okay. to, uh, to systematic theology in the sense that it, 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 it seeks to give basic you know quick summary of each of the doctrinal areas provide a biblical grounding i do think you see in in that and so it's a great resource it's a quick access right you can go and you can find things quickly and i still re recommend it to people for that but it doesn't have worked out um strong methodological um okay. point right so you know his intro chapter is one chapter it's not that long my prolegomena section will be part one and it'll be you know a hundred thousand words or so oh, geez, so okay, yeah. <laughs> so that's <laughs> that's going to be different yeah. where yeah i'm trying to set theology in terms of our contemporary context work properly from biblical to systematics now he doesn't deny any of those things but it's not no. worked out okay and and i'm also trying to 
uh, illustrate that by laying out the Bible storyline, even in, say, the Doctrine of the Trinity discussion, as I give biblical grounding to try to tie it to the covenantal unfolding of Scripture. Father, Son, and Spirit are there in the Old Testament, uh, yet not fully developed, obviously, until the coming of Christ and the giving yep. of the Spirit. But it's not just following even maybe some patristic exegesis that would just appeal to sort of isolated texts. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Christology of Proverbs 8 functioning as, you know, here's a great Christological text, eternal generation. I believe in all those classical truths. I'm not sure sometimes the grounding for them sure. is exegetically grounded so that I want to then be faithful to the text. So it's going to be different methodologically. Mm -hmm. It's going to, uh, he's got a lot of good, uh, you know, just quick resource and so on. Mine's trying to show interrelationships between doctrines mm -hmm. to help people think Theologically, so when we discuss divine revelation, I want to lay out the whole doctrine of God scripture relationship. Hmm. Uh, so that's there's a theme that runs through. Uh, so you're showing that that one area of doctrine affects another area of doctrine, right? So it's trying to spell that out and get people to think holistically in terms of a whole theology that then leads to a whole understanding of the world. Hmm. That's really helpful. Thank you. Yeah. In the last episode we had you on, uh, we believe it was the Crossway Work, The Person of Christ book that you wrote. Um, and so your background, as you've mentioned, uh, you've written on biblical theology. Uh, you've written on Christology, which is you know specifically the study of Christ. And maybe it bears some uh, definitions of, of all these things so we can understand what the difference between all those and systematic theology is. But now you're writing on topics of systematic theology. Um, so I guess the, the curiosity here is how have your previous works, what spe specifically like biblical theology, Christology actually helped fuel and influence and help your writing on systematic theology. Cause you know, they are distinguished. They are different, but how do you have them help out and also have this systematic theology distinguished based on its definition? Yeah. Yeah, no, it's a great question. And and uh, they may seem, you know, you're doing biblical theology. It's a kind of whole discipline. You're doing Christology. You know, mm -hmm. how are these all related and putting them together an entire theology? Uh, let me just, I mean, I'll say that they're totally related. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and and also that without doing though that previous work, I don't, I mean, I don't think I'd be able to put uh, this together. So mm -hmm. So the the it, actually my work in biblical theology, I mean, is, is was part of teaching courses mm -hmm. and so on, but actually came out of Christology. So that uh, as I was contracted uh, way on, the, the book we talked about was the short studies, but there mm -hmm. was the previous yeah. one with Crossway on God the Son Incarnate. As yep. mm -hmm. as I began to mm -hmm. work on that, I began to have to then think through well, how does the whole Bible present who Jesus is, mm -hmm. and then. From that, you know, get into uh, the storyline of Scripture, the covenants of Scripture, and so on. And of course, I was doing that already, given my my reformed uh, influence and uh, indebtedness to Gerhardus Voss and so on. But also with Baptistic convictions, wrestling with differences that we would have with you guys and others over the covenants, old and new, and the Abrahamic covenant, and how that fits. So all of that's part of the biblical theology, but it was really being driven by. Christology in the sense of, well, how does the Old Testament present Christ? How is he? Uh, I, I learned from people like Don Carson that says, well, just don't go to a kind of titles, you know, you go son of man, son of God, that's helpful, but see how the whole Bible is presenting this. And Gerardus Voss was good on that. When you think of who Jesus is and the resurrection, it's not just isolated text. It's, it's set within the whole eschatology of the Bible, grounded in creation and Adam to last Adam and, and, and so on. So that was crucial in in working through areas of biblical theology and covenantal structures. And then, of course, the his, history. Um, mm -hmm. So the move towards a real classical understanding of God and the person of Christ. So my training at uh, Trinity Evangelical Divinity School in the 80s and early 90s, uh, I, I'm so thankful for that. It was a wonderful experience i you know thank the lord for all the professors i had and it was just wonderful experience 
But I do say there was a weakness mm. um, uh, during that time. And I think this was largely in the evangelical world yeah. is that particularly on the doctrine of God, and then that mm -hmm. spills over to Christology, mm -hmm. there was uh, not a full, I think, understanding of the patristic and the historic position and the classical position. And, and so we greatly benefited from people like Richard Muller and then related to that Carl Truman. And mm -hmm. there was a recovery, you know, a retrieval of some of those areas that we really needed to retrieve and we needed to correct uh, some understandings, particularly, I think, on the Trinity and yep. divine simplicity and yep. all those areas. Yep. And so as I began to work with Christology, particularly then the will issue, uh, how many wills does oh, Christ yeah. have? Well, that ties <laughs> into, <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, that ties into, um, you know, how many wills are there in the Godhead? And yep. of course that got raised in the ERAS mm -hmm. issue. And yep. so long before all of that hit the fan in 2016, I had already left, you know, sort of basically, I think the ERAS view was the common view within much of conservative Big time. evangelical yep. circles. And I think we have to admit that. And that's, that's no problem. I mean, we, we just need to correct things. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was doing that in Christology. So, you know, you're doing biblical theology, you're doing Christology that's affecting Trinitarian mm -hmm. thought, doctrine mm -hmm. of God thought. And then, you know, you start thinking of, I was teaching courses on not only the person of Christ, but the work of Christ and what he does and how that spills over to salvation. And then the biblical theology moves to areas of church and Israel church and the structures of the Bible. So eventually what you're doing as you work in biblical theology, as you're working in how the Bible's put together, you're tying that to Christology, you're tying that to doctrine of God, you're tying that to soteriology, mm -hmm. you know, Christ's work to soteriology. Well, all of your doctrinal hmm. uh, areas are are coming together so They're that it's laid out. all... Yep. Yeah, it's all one woven uh, mm -hmm. view, an interwoven view, right? Theology is like a grand fabric and web that hangs together. And even, you know, in recent uh, days, just in working on, um, you know, the doctrine of humans have been benefited greatly as I thought through covenants and creation covenant and covenant of works. I've had to, you mm -hmm. know, benefit greatly from Herman Bavink and, mm -hmm. uh, and others who in and over against the Roman Catholic view mm -hmm. of, sort of pure nature and super added, yeah, gift super added and so on. all that stuff. Yep. Yeah. Even seeing importance there that then ties to Christ humanity mm -hmm. and so on. So, I mean, all of that is linking a whole theology together and it's prepared me to be able to, at this point in time, you know, try to write a systematic that is coherent and fits mm -hmm. together and so on. Yeah. Well, nice. I, I mean, I hope this gets people really, I mean, this is getting me excited to read the work. We already have the PDF, but uh, this gets me even more excited to read it, more classical theism, more historic reformed orthodoxy, of course, from the, the Baptist progressive, progressive covenantal perspective, but it's going to be big time help for both Presbyterians and Christians in general. Um, so we talked about this before recording and people see volume one and they're like, oh no, how many volumes are <laughs> in this, in this series? So what's What's projected in this? And then general, like we, you've already kind of laid this out, but how do you break up the theolo theological loci? What's kind of your perspective on this? What can people expect when they walk into this work? Yeah, no, that's great. Uh, there, it, it's projected, uh, Lord willing, and uh, giving grace and strength type of thing to do two volumes, right? Okay. So, so not like and, a like, four-volume bobbing thing. It's just, just two, just no, two no. volumes. No, I mean, it would be... It'd be great to do that but uh sure. that that's a, it's a lot of work i don't know how bowing i don't know how some of these guys have done that in the past i mean and they're so good right they're so they're rich so good yeah and, mm -hmm. yeah you don't even try to compete with them because uh, no. they're, no. they're in a different category <laughs> yeah but uh so no originally it's interesting it may be interesting the backstory here is yeah. that uh originally it was scheduled to be a one volume right and okay. part of that is you know we live in a marketing age and yep. trying to sell these things and yeah. multiple well, volumes last big uh, one was one volume that was with uh grudem but then you have horton's christian faith in yeah. 2010 whatever it was yeah so so i think that was the original projection but then since then interesting you know a number of multiple volume works have come out you think of uh joel beakey and mm -hmm. and uh paul smalley and all that you know that's a multi-volume work and, volumes, and others yeah. are projected to do that so as i was working on it towards the goal of one volume <laughs> so it sort of it sort of happened as I went. I realized that um, this is going to be difficult to do in in one volume. So it was supposed to be somewhere 
you know, no more than 500,000 words Jeez, for, okay. for one volume. Yeah. And uh, as, as I was working on it, I realized that's going to be difficult. So that's I, a, that's a uh, hefty book. <laughs> yeah. So I plugged, I plugged to uh, B&H and said, well, how about let's turn it into two volumes of say 350, right? So that would give me 700 versus 500. This one turned out to be uh, about 400 or so. So it'll probably be 400, 400. <laughs> but uh, they said, yeah. And, and I also said, uh, it's difficult to I be, mean, you could put out one volume, but then it's hard to say too much, right? When you're trying to cover everything in one volume, even though you think, oh, that's a lot of pages, you start trying to do what I'm trying to do. And, and, you know, you beyond just sort of surface treatment, yeah. uh, it's difficult. So they said, yeah. And there's multi volumes coming out. A lot of seminaries, colleges, and so on have either two or maybe three theology courses so that mm -hmm. it could fit there. So they were gracious enough and kind enough to allow for uh, two volumes. And then in terms of break up, right. I mean, that sort of happened um, because it was originally as one, it sort of happened in terms of the space, uh, yeah. you know, in, in terms of where I was. So once I got the green light to, to have two volumes, which is what I was doing, I, I had a year sabbatical that Southern was so kind to, to give. So as I, got the green light on that. Uh, I, I expanded. So I was trying to keep things, you know, mm. you budget it out, say, okay, so many words for this chapter, so many words for mm. this chapter. But as I got the green light on that, I expanded the doctrine of God section more than I ever would have done. So, mm. so oh, okay. half, okay. half of this volume uh, really is the entire doctrine of God. Right. So I didn't think that was a, a, a bad thing because no, not at all because of all the discussions that are going on, I wanted to lay out a classical, yep. uh, you know, historic position type of thing. So this, this volume will, you know, cover issues of methodology, prolegomena. I, I'm big on that, that we have to think through how to read scripture, how to draw theology, do so in light of history and, 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 and so on. So that's part one. And then part two lays, you know, there was a choice here of where to go, but in just in terms of the grounding to theology, because I set it up in part one in terms of our time that we live in a, an age that is d denied Christian faith, mm -hmm. you know, at least in the West, yep. a secular, pluralistic, postmodern. So we have to, we don't live in the Reformation anymore. I mean, no one denied truth in the Reformation, but we do today. So, yep. so we have to then think of how do we speak Christian theology into our contemporary context and then uh, laying the grounding of that in divine revelation. So I try to present what I'm calling a theology from above, which is really from divine yep. revelation yep. in contrast to more yeah, liberal theology and so on. And then, and then part three is laying out the storyline. So can into concept, you know, our, our doctrines come from the whole Bible. So what is that whole Bible? And then part four, the doctrine of God. So volume two, we'll pick up with um, humans, sin, build on you know what's been previous and then all the way to eschatology so it, the, the main sort of loci will be covered in volume two but there's there's a lot here that's setting up and dealing with whole bible and doctrine of god and doctrine of god will include everything from his being who he is apart from creation attributes trinity as well as all of his divine decree uh creation providence and all those areas awesome that's good yeah that's that's helpful and especially kind of contemporary context, both evangelical and outside of evangelicalism. These are important things to kind of hit pretty hard um, with some contemporary issues, but also yeah, how do we speak this into a, a non-Christian, individualistic, atheistic, whatever it may be, um, postmodern world? And how do we how do you speak this stuff into it? Yeah, and it and it's and and the way I've I've written it, it's probably similar to what I did with um my volume on God, the son incarnate. Okay. Because I don't, I don't, so I'm grounded in history. Yep. You can't do contemporary thought without grounding it in the mm -hmm. history of the church, historical theology, the confessions and so on, uh, the confessional creedal heritage, but, but also in, in terms of contemporary thought, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to say, okay, what kind of world do we live in? So where I need to engage sort of non Orthodox, um, uh, non evangelical theologians, I do, but it's not just simply, a rehash of yeah. every single, uh, you know, sort of theologian out there. I, I'm trying to, it's, it's written for the church, right? So it's, 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 it's interacting with those views, but trying to help them see the kind of world we live in, right? It's not just the interaction with contemporary theologians, we're interaction with the larger culture, mm -hmm. right? So, so it's not just discussion of every single tidbit within contemporary theology, totally. 
And and so that that that's a bit of a different thrust than maybe some who will yeah. get into every debate with Carl Bart, every debate with Robert Jensen, and every debate <laughs> yeah. with. So yeah. where I need to discuss, you know, Wolf Arpanabarg and Christology or others in Trinity and so on, it it comes through there. But I'm you know I want somebody, a pastor, yeah. seminary student, uh, lay person to be able to pick that up and say this has helped me understand doctrine understand the christian position uh from you know reformed and covenantal and uh, baptist viewpoint yet uh it's it's helping me engage the world hmm. that's helpful hmm. yep yeah and bridging into from that to this question it's kind of helpful because this book does say you say it's trinitarian reformational and baptistic um so can you talk about how these uh, those three words that you mentioned there uh, really center the focus of the book and this project overall to, again, that contemporary context. Yeah. 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 And well, maybe I mean, a, all, a yeah, quick well, little like thing I forgot to add to this. Maybe what, like, since you were maybe, like describing the different covenantal um, ideas that maybe that like, but like uh, 69 federalism or progressive covenantals, maybe how that can, feed into this as well yeah 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 so i i picked the you know those terms trinitarian so hopefully all of our theology yeah. is trinitarian <laughs> sure so. and everything else yeah but yeah i mean you know there has been particularly in in uh my circles right in the sense of more baptistic circles i mean maybe not historically but in the contemporary no. world we we have chapter on the trinity or something like that and then it doesn't get discussed much elsewhere hmm. uh so even with scripture you know, we'll speak about inspiration in terms of the superintendence of the work of the Holy Spirit. And of course, that's exactly correct. But it's also Trinitarian action, right? So the one true God who is Father, Son, and Spirit acts inseparably in every external action, whether that's creation, revelation, redemption. So trying to bring that to bear in every matter, right? So our doctrine of Scripture isn't just, um, oh, here's the Holy Spirit, but where's the Father and Son, to to bring that all together so every every matter of obviously the doctrine of god but as it moves into to humans to the person and work of christ i mean it's thoroughly trinitarian it's not just talking about the son of god it's talking about the relation of father to spirit even in christology and then the work of salvation and and so on so that's the trinitarian is to really the one true god that we worship is the triune god and mm -hmm. that is not just you know, a conundrum that we try to solve in one chapter, it, it's all throughout. We cannot have Christian theology without the Trinity, and it starts from beginning to end. It's God who is uh, the one who deserves all worship, honor, and praise. He's the one who's always been there. He's the one who, out of the fullness of his life, then his external works are are given. And so creation is a triune act, providence is a triune act, and and and, and so on. And then reformational, I mean, that's Situating it particularly in terms of yes, it's classical, but it's it's indebted to the Reformation. I still am convinced that uh, the Reformation was necessary, that mm. it was a corrective in the history of the Church. That uh, as much as the Roman Catholic tradition uh, holds to things in common with us, mm. uh, this is not Roman Catholic, right? It's Reformational. It's Protestant justification by grace through faith, sola scriptura, and particularly even in our day and certain evangelical debates, I mean, a strong emphasis on sola scriptura. That doesn't mean biblicism in the sense that it's independent of creeds and confessions, mm -hmm. yet the final authority rests with scripture. And I'm happy to uh, to defend that and argue that and to do so even in methodological sections that I'm not convinced that um, earlier uh, hermeneutical views such as the fourfold method of exegesis and a move away, you know, sort of a redefinition of literal sense and so on. I think the reformers uh, actually are precise in that, the post reform tradition, and even those who move into biblical theology. There's development there that's reformational with the work of Gerhardus Voss and others, the Dutch tradition with Bavink. So theology is, is over time, we're becoming more precise in light of challenges and issues. So we don't just freeze it in the patristic era or the medieval era. The Reformation is crucial, and even the post-Reformation uh, is crucial for our theology as well. And then tied to the covenantal, right? So I 
am convinced with uh, Reformed theology. And as it unfolded in the uh, Reformation and post-Reformation era, that the, the Bible's own categories, the Bible's own structures, the way God relates to us is he is the covenant God. Mm -hmm. And the covenants are not just you know, window dressing and so on. Uh, they are the means by which God relates to us and the plan of God, the divine plan from all eternity um, is then unfolded through those covenants, beginning with uh, creation, beginning with Adam and his role pre post fall with all that he is as created as good and the, and the impact of the fall. And then ultimately the plan of redemption uh, reform thought will tie it as to the covenant of grace. I mean, that concept I hold to in terms of the one plan of God, I'm going to lay it out in terms of the covenantal unfolding, mm -hmm. uh, the one plan through the covenants and, and then culminating in that, which all of it's leading to is Christ and the new covenant and, and what he has achieved for us and the old Testament, as it looks forward to that and anticipatory of that. And that will get into the second volume with issues of salvation and so on, but it's one way of salvation, one Lord, and save your justification by grace through faith in Christ alone, faith alone, grace alone, Christ alone. So, and it will pick up some of the, at that point, when we get into some of the covenants, particularly new covenant, the new covenant community, mm -hmm. uh, you know, issues of circumcision, baptism, then it picks up strongly the baptistic mm -hmm. uh, elements at that point. But beyond that, I mean, when you're laying out doctrine of God, human sin, mm -hmm. sovereign grace, uh, soteriology, justification, sanctification, adoption, and so on. I mean, it's thoroughly yep. classical, reformational, Protestant, and uh, Calvinistic. Hmm. Nice. That's good. Yeah. So us, us reformed Presbyterians can read this book and we can, we can profit from a Baptist. This is, this is good stuff. I like it. Well, I've, I've profited from the entire tradition, right? So there you go. Yep. Uh, I, I don't stand uh, alone. I, stand on the shoulders of the reformation and just because i think the reformation should have continued a bit further <laughs> yeah. uh in terms of some some areas yeah. doesn't mean then that uh you know my heritage is is not reformational and particularly benefited so much now with the translation of of the dutch tradition yep. and uh, that coming through the westminster tradition princeton westminster i mean yep. that's that's my lineage and heritage as well so that's good i like it uh, you also engage in church history. You've already talked about this is historically grounded, and you just you discuss as we've talked about this a little bit in relation to contemporary issues, and I'm and kind of fronting that, and then also talking about I think many look at systematic theologies whether they've read one or not, and they assume it's academic, it's a little dry, that like has no bearing to kind of contemporary life. Like what's what's the point of this stuff? It's all high and dry theology but you ground these doctrines historically and penetrate modernity. Maybe not the way people expect, but I think the way they like said that pastors and, and lay people and theologians can benefit from. So what you've talked about this, maybe dive a little bit more. Like what is, what does this look like instead of just, okay, these are doctrines we have to believe, but these actually mean something historically in, in, uh, in, in modernity as well. Yeah. So that's, I'm, I'm trying to do that to show uh, if systematic theology isn't just dry. Uh, it's not just an academic enterprise. It's 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 the life blood of the church, right? So theology, and in, in the way I'm defining it, obviously is the study of of the triune God and all things in relation to Him. But I do pick up the uh, sort of a second aspect of that from John Frame and and define that in terms of the application. So it's the study of the triune God and all things related to Him, and by by the very application of Scripture to all area of life. And of course, when we see that all right our our greatest study is who god is but then all of what who he is and what he has planned and what he has brought about in every area of life so theology is absolutely essential to know who he is to know who we are to know how to live in the world to how to think about the world uh to know what to do to know how to live and and so on so when we don't have sound theology we're tossed back by Every wind of doctrine, we adopt the thought of the day. We become syncretistic in the sense that we take something from the Bible and we mix it with contemporary culture. And what comes out in the end usually is contemporary culture and uh, and not scripture. So, you know, I'm trying to help, you know, teach people that uh, theology is absolutely essential. It's always been that way. Theology is properly, right, thinking through the whole counsel of God, uh, you know, faith-seeking understanding. We seek to understand what God has revealed about himself and about ourselves and who we are in relationship to him and the great work of the Redeemer. So there's nothing more practical 
uh, than theology, right? Systematic theology is uh, putting God's revelation to practice in terms of properly understanding all that he has said. And apart from doing that, we will be anemic, are spiritually impoverished. And of course, we aren't just the first people to do this, right? We stand on the heritage of, the, of those who've gone before, and we must learn from our forefathers. So the whole emphasis today that we see on retrieval, retrieval is mm -hmm. a great I mean, very. That's really what we've always should have been doing, right? We stand mm -hmm. on the shoulders of those who've gone before us. Yet, some in the retrieval movement. I mean, I tweak it a little bit in the sense that uh, some, I think, almost um, retrieve, but we all, you know, almost go back and, if we're not careful, freeze an era or not mm -hmm. uh, fully see, critique maybe some of the problems of of some of those previous ones. And I don't think anybody would say they're not uh, providing a critique of it but some sure. some writings as of late almost is you know that's that's retrieve aquinas without ever kind of criticizing him right sure. uh, without sort of saying hey there's some differences yep. that are here so we stand on the shoulders but we do so in light of the past and we also bring scripture as final authority to bear on everything that we say so hopefully people will see that we cannot uh, you know we're not the first ones to think about who God is and think about creation and providence. But we uh, we bring all of that to bear in terms of uh, how we understand scripture and how we apply it to the contemporary world. So it's not just a historical theology. We learn from the past, mm -hmm. but we, it's also applied to the present day and, and, and issues of our day. So theology has to constantly be done, be written. Not that the gospel changes, scripture doesn't change, but it's application, right? In terms of mm -hmm. contemporary issues, taking on contemporary matters. In volume two, I've been putting together and wrestling with in terms of humans and sin. When you mm -hmm. think of the doctrine of humanity, I mean, how much oh. Calvin didn't talk about LGBT, did he? No. <laughs> um, you know, he wasn't there. I mean, you didn't have scientific technology, no. artificial intelligence. I mean, so I can't write a book on all of that, but our doctrinal formulation of image yeah. of God of who we are has to say something to yep. those issues if we're going to be a help to uh, the contemporary church. And so that's what that's trying to do. So grounding it in scripture, learning from the past, not reinventing the wheel. That's why the classical view, particularly in terms of doctrine of God and so on. And then, you know, even in Providence, where I wrestle with Arminian Calvinists, you know, that goes back to Augustinian views and through the Reformation. And these aren't just views that show up in contemporary discussions. Uh, they're rooted in the past. And there's things that we learn from the past and we don't want to repeat the mistakes of the past. Mm -hmm. So hopefully then we can be more, you know, as we stand on the shoulders of those before us, we're wiser, hopefully, and uh, we don't uh, just repeat the mistakes that others have done. Hmm. That's really helpful. Yeah, and that answer kind of it partly answers my last question is just um, the hope that you have of what the readers will get out of this reminder of the Reformation and the truths and biblical truths and things like that. Um, so I can only imagine as an author – when you're writing a book, when you're preparing to write a book, uh, this, you know, it probably takes a while to do all this. You have prayers, you have hopes and goals in your mind, as well as the publisher, obviously. You have a lot of conversations. <laughs> so um, wrapping all that up, during that whole process, what were things going through your mind of your, your specific hopes, prayers, and goals that students, pastors, professors, interested lay people would come away with after engaging this work? Yeah, I mean, that's that, that's a crucial question because that, you know, as you write it, you say, what am I, what am I trying to, you always have to say, what am I trying to achieve? What's the goal in doing that, right? And uh, constantly uh, both praying that the Lord would help me do this and also interacting with others is, is how, how can this be a help to the today's church, right? How can they pick this up and and you know think through uh the attributes of god think through divine providence not just to say what does the bible say on these matters and and how to think you know in terms of whole bible but also you know how do i live it out how is this comfort to me how is this also applied to the contemporary issues and and answering the contemporary questions that are there right so my Goal and prayer for the work is that, I mean, I, I don't think that uh, I'm brilliant in any way. I'm trying to give uh, historic Christian faith uh, to today's church and to do so in, in some of the distinctives that 
that we've already talked about, but uh, they pick it up and and first glory in who God is, right? Glory in the triune God who has been from all eternity, who has made us, who's made us for himself, uh, creation, providence, and then redemption. So they know him more, that, that it's a God-centeredness into their lives because this is a God-centered universe. He's at the center of all things. And that theology comes from our understanding of him and who he is and his revelation. And then from that, right, that we are given a uh, sure foundation for our lives. We're given truth. We're given a revelation. We're given a scripture that's reliable and authoritative. So the whole section on divine revelation is to shore up people's conviction that God has spoken. He is, to use the language of Francis Schaeffer, the God who is there, but he is there and he is not silent and he has made himself known. So we can we can have in this secular postmodern pluralistic age, we we know that God has spoken to us. There's a sure grounding for our life and ultimately in death and for all eternity, that this God is the one who has made himself known and, and to unpack uh, his uh, aseity, his independence, his self-sufficiency, his triune uh, nature, so that uh, as we think of his plan, as we think of his uh, the, even the doctrine of providence, that it's grounded in him who is our life and who deserves all of our worship and praise centered in the glory of the gospel and the glory of Christ. And so if people can walk away with uh, being grounded with uh, this is true, this is foundational, that there's reasons uh, that there are given, not only here's a exposition of theology, but reasons to to give hope and to believe and to, to trust and to uh, there, this, you know, the gospel is worthy and it's to be proclaimed and the mission of the church is to continue with all the voices that are around us, I mean, that would be a crucial um, uh, aim that I would have. And if that was ever achieved, then I would say the Lord has used that work uh, to help the church be faithful today in the context by which we live, not just the past, but the present day and the challenges of our day. Hmm. Well, this all sounds, I mean, really fantastic. And I, we really do hope people go to our show notes or if you're not on our show notes, go go to B&H or Amazon, wherever you find find books and pick this up for yourself. If you're a professor, maybe consider putting this in your systematic theology courses. If you're a pastor, maybe consider doing maybe a little bit study with your congregation, with some members. If you're a Bible study leader, having this help you kind of frame some of your discussions on this. Uh, but this has been a pleasure. And maybe uh, plug some of the stuff that you're doing, Dr. Willem. I know you have a, a podcast you've been working on for uh, the past year or so. So where can people find you? And then Lastly, if you know, if you don't, that's perfectly fine. I don't like, is, is there any projected date for volume two? Like what's, what's some of this stuff yeah, look like? Yeah. Well, that'd be start with volume two, right? I'm working on it right now. Um, so I'm trying to get that done within, you know, the next year type of thing. Yep. And then, you know, get that in the pipeline. So this comes out, hopefully that will follow, you know, uh, in a, in a couple of years that the next one will come out. I need to get that done and mm -hmm. keep my promises and, <laughs> uh, honor, <laughs> honor my commitments to, B and H and and so on. I mean, the, the challenge obviously is is you know in a busy teaching, yeah. Uh, schedule is finding the time and and uh, these these issues. Uh, you, you try to communicate them to to help the church, but they're not easy. You have to think no. through them, and uh, to do so well for today's uh, time, you know, you have to address the contemporary issues as well. So yeah, I appreciate prayers uh, to finish that up and and to do that well, and that it would really achieve. The goal that I would have is to help the church and to glorify uh, the Lord. But um, in terms of uh, reaching me, uh, I, I haven't had a ton of social media in the past, <laughs> uh, but a, a few friends of mine, uh, we've started uh, a website called Christ Overall. Mm -hmm. You can find it at all that all together as one word, ChristOverall.com. And, and we do various podcast posting and I'm doing much more there with uh, helping with some podcasts and others uh, posting material. Uh, we're trying to give, you know, biblical theological content for the church as, as many people are doing, but to do so in a way that uh, builds the church up that engages some of these contemporary issues. So in some sense, it's an outworking of what I'm trying to do in the systematics where to, to ground everything in scripture, but also to, uh, to address uh, the issues of our day. So that's probably the best place uh, to find me. And also at Southern Seminary, we welcome students and uh, people to come here and, uh, and and study and so on. And then there's other things, I think, on YouTube and uh, sermon audio and, and, and other areas that, uh, you know, I can be found at various things that I've spoken at and so on. Awesome. Well, Dr. Wolm, it's been 
Pleasure having you on for the second time. Talk about systematic theology, all things in relation to systematic theology and God, the doctrine of God, classical theism, reformed thought, covenantalism. We covered a lot today, but it's, thank you for your work. Thank you for writing this. And uh, yeah, we do pray and, and hope that the second volume goes well, goes smoothly, that you put the work into it, and then it comes out in a timely manner, as I'm sure the publisher also wants as well. I'm sure you want as well, too. But thank you so much for coming on, and, and thank you for talking about your book. Thank you. A real honor to be with you guys, and uh, thanks for having me on again. Thank of course. You.